Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now that I've already obtained all this, or have already arrived, not that I've already obtained all this, sorry, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which, Christ has co- for which God has called me heavenward in, in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take a, such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Uh, A few weeks ago, I was in the midst of a conversation with a few people and it went a bit like this. What even is mates on a mission? What does it actually mean? We hear Andy say it, but what does it even mean? What if I'm not personally friends with Andy or personally friends with Sam? Can I even use that phrase? Uh, Previously, when I've shared, I shared in Philippians 1, joy in suffering, and Philippians 2, joy in serving. And as I began to read Philippians 3, joy in believing, I started to think, this is it. This is mates on a mission. Joy in believing, the joy of being in him, one common goal, one purpose together, going for it with Jesus. Paul talks about, oh, amazing, thank you. Paul talks about being in him in the suffering and then being in him in the serving, but then he comes back again and he says, actually, be in him in the suffering and be in him in the serving, but actually just be in him. Like, forget what's going on, whether things are good or bad, whether you're poor or rich, whether you're smart or a bit stupid, just be in him. Looking to him, keeping our eyes fixed on him, seeing who he is and allowing him to do a work in us so that we can be more like him. You know, we can only become like someone if we look to them, if we spend time with them. And if we look at their character, we can become like them. If we take our gaze from them, then we're not going to become like them. It's quite scary sometimes when you're around the same people all the time and you find yourself using mannerisms. And I'm like, oh, I've just done an Andy or I've just done a Sam. It's like it's a little bit scary. But we have a responsibility despite how painful it can be at times, to look to Jesus and to become more like him, to allow him to do a work in us so that when people look at us, it's him that they see and we're all so far from that. Um, Have you ever sang one of those songs? One of my favourite songs is uh, Refiner by Maverick City. It's actually one of my favourite songs, but also one of the most scary songs to sing. 
It says, I want to be tried by fire, purified. Take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I can't tell you the amount of times I've sang that song and really meant it with all my heart. And then suddenly my heart's gone, oh, but God, not, not something bad yet. I've done enough of that. Maybe, maybe something little I can cope with, but nothing really bad. And then you have to remember again, God, here's my life. Take what you need to take from me. I want to be purified to live for you. We recently, uh, I was going to say started renovating our house. We didn't. We just wanted to have a new kitchen. But in the midst of the kitchen being done, the living room floor, something went wrong with the living room floor. And so we had to rip up the carpet. And then we said, okay, we need some new flooring. And I said, well, we don't want to get new flooring until we've sorted out the patio doors. So maybe should we rip the patio doors out? And so Andy ripped the patio doors out with his mate. And then we discovered that there was no lintel above it, so nothing was holding the house up properly. Um, and then in the middle of that, I was like, I hate these skirting boards, so let's take the skirting boards off. Let's put the new skirting boards on. And before we knew it, we were in the middle of a house renovation. And we're still going 12 months on. Sometimes it can be a little bit like that with God. Sometimes we feel like he's decorating a bit of a room. And then other times we feel like he's renovating the whole house and it gets a little bit scary. And we're like, God, I didn't sign up to this level. Like I didn't, but we did. <laughs> when we gave him his heart, when we chose him, we signed up to be refined by him. That means forgetting what's behind and pressing on to what's ahead. And you know, it's not always easy. You know, sometimes it's constant dialogue. I find myself in constant dialogue with God. I could be talking to someone and in the back of my mind, I'm going, God, give me wisdom. God, give me strength. God, give me peace all the time. Um, because we're not always going to get it right. And we need loads of grace for each other. Every morning when I pray to go to work, when I pray to work, I pray my way to work. Every morning when I drive to work, I pray. My prayer every morning is, God, would you have enough grace for me? Because I'll mess up today. And God, would you give me enough grace for the people? Because other people are going to mess up and I need the grace for them. Sometimes life's going that hard that actually even those conversations aren't happening. And all we're doing is speaking his name. All we're doing is trying to look to him. I remember when my, my kids were little and they uh, were learning to ride a bike. And at the time, they, we lived on a cul-de-sac, so it was nice and safe. And I got them on the bikes. I'll, I'll use they. It was two different times, a year apart. And um, they're cycling. And, and you know what it's like? It's like, this is a great idea. I'll teach my kids to ride a bike. And then the tears come and the, the cuts and bruises. And it's like, oh, my goodness, this is a nightmare. And so we're riding down the road and they've fallen off a few times and they're a bit miserable. And uh, the same thing happened, exactly the same thing happened with both of them. I don't know why I didn't learn the lesson the first time. <laughs> um, so I said to them, right, get back on your bike. What can you see down the road? There's a red tree. Okay, you can see a red tree. What I want you to do is I want you to start to pedal like you were before. But this time, I want you to keep your eyes on the red tree. You are not allowed to look anywhere else. My kids were quite obedient. So me saying you're not allowed to look anywhere else had them like fixated on this tree. So much so that Dion's uh, cycling down the road and Amy's cycling down the road and they're going, they don't cycle with the hands, they cycle with the feet, but they're cycling down the road and they're going, red tree, red tree, red tree, red tree, red tree. And then they turn the bike around and they go into the other end of the road. I said, what can you see? The other end of the road is a red door. He says, go to the other end of the road. Red door, red door, red door. And that's all he did, up and down the road. Red tree, red tree, red tree, red door, red door, red door. Don't know if it earned him any friends. Looked a bit weird. But sometimes that's what life's like. Sometimes life's throwing stuff at us where all we can do is say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. My eyes are on you. I'm not looking down because if I look down, I'm going to fall. If I look down, I'm not going to make it. Last week, I uh, visited Sam Joseph in hospital. Many of you will know Sam's story. Sam is currently waiting for a heart transplant. And, um, but she came to us having taken herself off the heart transplant list. Now, Sam wouldn't be in that hospital now if it wasn't for Jesus. Because one day, she accepted Jesus and it changed everything. She would say she had a heart transplant, a spiritual heart transplant. Because with God, there's no waiting. It's a universal match. And when we accept him, he's there, ready and waiting you know, years ago, I read a book years ago, 
uh, that was recommended to me, and it was about <laughs> recommend a book when your kids go and do heart surgery, recommend a book about heart surgery. It's probably not the best idea, but it was a really good book. And uh, it talked about when the heart, when heart operations, sorry, did I say kids waiting for heart transplant? That wasn't true. It was heart operation. Um, when they did the first heart operations before they had a heart and lung machine to keep the body going, they would instead use a donor body. And so you would have your donor body, your donor person lay on the bed, on a bed next to your bed. And their heart would be plumbed into the workings of your body. And they would keep you alive while the doctor worked on your heart. And it's such a picture of Jesus. Plumbed in, ready to go. Come on, you're connected to me now. Let's work on your heart while you're connected to me. It's going to be painful. You might have scars, but it'll be so worth it. It's the pain in the pro. It's in the pain of the process that God does some amazing things and where characters are formed, when we allow God into our brokenness and he does something incredible. Refining is really painful. Like so often you want to shy away from it. I'm like, I'd rather not go through the process. Thanks, just take me from A to B. Let me leave that one behind because we've all experienced the pain of life, the problems that do require healing because we can't sometimes just move on. We can't just pretend it hasn't happened we can't just live with hang-ups, things that hinder us. We need to throw them off. We've got to get the hang-ups and issues addressed. And Jesus is there, right there, to do it with us, preparing our hearts for what's to come. It's when God meets us there that we get to see how he loves us and love like him. Where we get to see how he serves and serve like him. See how he forgives and forgives, like, forgive like him. See how he shows grace and mercy and show the same grace and mercy. It's there that we meet him. It's there that we get to see his character and go with it. It's there that we get to learn from him. All of us, same common purpose, allowing him to do a work in us so that he can do a work through us. Mates on a mission, that's what it's about. But there's a saying, isn't there, and it's that you can take a horse to water but you can't make it drink. Jesus can offer us everything, but we've got to choose to take it. We've got to choose to use it. We can carry on and be stuck in that place of hurt, and we're affecting other people. I know myself. I know the things that, that I, I have to be careful of because of past stuff. I've got to deal with it with God, otherwise I'm going to be affecting other people with the way I am. Need peace? Then take the peace that God offers you. That's available need some more patience, take the patience that God already offers you. He's given us everything, it's there. We can't complain that we've not got enough to get through. We can't complain that we just can't deal with stuff because God has given us everything we need. Need a bit of grace. He's given it us there. It's there and it's available to be used, but we've got to take it. Need to know how to love well. Look to Jesus. He's given us enough love for everybody, but we've got to choose to take what's available. Someone doing your head in, struggling. I'm sure there's no one in this room that's done your head in. But if they have, maybe start by turning your eyes off them and looking to Jesus. Because it's there that you'll get everything you need to deal with whatever's going on, with the kindness that you need to deal with it with. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. We're in it together. This isn't a one-man show. We get to do it together. We get to work together in it. We get to call each other closer to Jesus because salvation wasn't the end of the story. God calls us to be redeemed and restored so that we can fulfill our mission here on earth. But it comes with a responsibility. I'm 
responsibility of heading towards living a life worthy of God, becoming more like him and pointing others towards him so that his kingdom can come on earth. We carry something of him. When he, when he left us with his spirit, we're carrying something of him. But flip. <laughs> I look over my days and I think if I truly was carrying him in the way I should, there's so many decisions that I'd make differently. There's so many areas of my life that I'd need to change. What a responsibility when it's others looking on to carry him well. I want others to see him. I don't want my issues to get in the way of what others see. Jesus, make us more like you. Sometimes we have our eyes fixed on things and it's not even the wrong thing. Sometimes we're looking for good stuff. We're looking for that great career. We're looking at the promise that God has given us. We're looking at the calling that we think is on our life or we know is on our life. We're looking at future family, future stuff. And it's all great stuff. Like it's good to sort of see where God's calling us. It's good to remember the promise of God over our lives. But it's not our promise. It's God's promise over us. The plan that we're looking to is not our plan. It's God's plan for us. All he wants and all he needs is us and our eyes fixed on him and he'll work out the rest. Like so often I think we get scared that God's not going to see us. But he's got a plan and a purpose. He doesn't need us to jump in the air and wave our arms for him to see us. And remember that plan. Oh, forgot about you, forgot about that plan. God sees us and he knows us. He needs to see our joy in believing, the joy of being in him, the joy that he's enough, no matter what's going on, the joy of adoption, a citizenship of heaven, declared righteous in his sight by the grace that he offers, hidden by him and seen by him. And it's in that place of being content in him and knowing that he's enough. And knowing that he'll work out his plans and purposes as we keep our eyes on him. Pressing on to take hold of that which he took hold of us. That we set aside our selfish ways. Because we can be such a selfish people. Who are desperate, desperate for God to see us. But desperate for for. To be seen, really, I think. And and actually, God knows, God sees. It's when we set aside the selfish ambition that we really do become mates on a mission, all looking in one direction, all looking to him and all becoming more like him. We pray. Oh, God, we're sorry. We're sorry for the times where we get it wrong. God, we're sorry for the times where our hearts just don't reflect yours. We're sorry for the moments where self creeps in. God, we want to point people to you. We want our eyes fixed on you, God. We want nothing less than all that you're calling us to, nothing less than you. So God, right now we fix our eyes back on you. God, we say if there's any areas in us that we need to right now give over to you, right now just sacrifice and say, God, take it all. Whatever you need to do in us, God, would you, would you begin that work now, God? And we say we give you permission, God, to refine us, to make us more like you. Thank you, God, for your grace when we get it wrong. Thank you for your grace, God. Come back to you today. We set our eyes back on the one who's worth it all. Have your way, Jesus. You've been watching Message Live. And we hope it's been a great encouragement to you. Would you subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook. And ring that bell for notifications. And thanks for watching.